Arundel and Prince George's counties and the state of Maryland to grow opposition to the building of the SC Network. The LSIA represents over 2,000 households and we stand with our neighbors to oppose the SC Network. We are joined this evening by several incumbents and candidates who have taken time from their busy schedules to be here tonight as our guests. We also want to acknowledge representatives and members from several AA and PG County organizations with us tonight. Again, we appreciate all of you taking your time to be here tonight, especially with the Ravens. <laughs> Welcome all. It is now my pleasure to introduce my Vice President of the LSIA, Jan Weber, who will lay out the rules for governing tonight's meeting. Thank you, Susan. This meeting is about the SC Magma. No other issues or questions will be answered. We have a very short time to get through an agenda of, of items for this meeting. We're going to start, this is going to start us off with some information sharing, and then as we get through the meeting, we're going to go into a question and answer session. We have many incumbents and candidates attending tonight to answer questions. They are our guests, and we expect them to be treated as such. Be respectful of each other, or you will be asked to leave. One person speak at a time. Keep it short and to the point, or we'll cut you off. This is not the place for time to pontificate. We want to thank Lieutenant Frazier and the officers of AA County Police for being here tonight to make sure that things go well. And it's now my pleasure and my honor to introduce the Chair of the Citizens Against the SC Magna, who will be leading this meeting. Mr. Dennis Frazier. They 
noted how no one from the public had weighed in on their application and their request. And they were surprised that no competing interests were trying for this license. So this has been going on for many years outside of public purview, and that troubled the two women that started this session, that were reformed and last October, the second round of open houses at Bowie State, they had over 800 people. Remember I said in April there were 16 to 18, and over 800 of them. We attribute that spike in the attendance to our efforts, not MPA and not the proponents. The uh, other two meetings, one at Laurel High School and one at Rundle High School, had six, five, six, maybe seven hundred people show up. So it is through the activism of our group that word has gotten out. We don't disagree that there's a need to address transportation, especially long distance rail transportation. But we believe this is the wrong way to do it. We believe <coughs> this facility, few people will really benefit from it. You're talking about stops between Baltimore and Washington with one at the airport. And then later they want to go to New York City with a stop in Wilmington. Philadelphia Airport, Philadelphia, I'm sorry, uh, Newark Airport, and uh, New York City. So it really is not going to be anything that will ease congestion, will help getting people to and from their work, their residence, and what have you. And, but it will be a consumer of uh, available dollars. Now, and it's interesting, they will talk about how all of this will be public, uh, privately financed. The tickets are going to pay for the maintenance and operation of the facility. That's what they say publicly. And then they talk about how no project like this can be 100% private. It's got to be a public private. Public means tax dollars. Okay. I thought I had the idea. I thought I was missing something. Um, so, so we believe there's a better way to spend the dollars to solve our congestion problems than this. That's the bottom line of what we're looking at. We believe Amtrak can be improved. We believe that yeah, this will not provide many jobs. And we believe that it's been deceptive in how it's been presented as well as how there's been a lack of transparency with MPA. You ask questions. They tell, they tell us, they told the state legislature that there's a mailing list and they send out periodic updates and what have you to people who subscribe to it. Well, I have to subscribe to two. Um, I subscribe to it and I've got two in over a year. So we have a problem with the lack of transparency, lack of information. We ask questions, we don't get responses. So we, we have. Uh, Great concern that this is being driven more as a development of a available. Uh, they're, they're trying to create a market for Japanese product and Japanese technology. So that we have been working uh, with our state legislators to oppose it. We believe there are better ways to solve our, our problems, our transportation problems. And we believe that it would be better uh, to put dollars, available dollars, into existing infrastructure to improve it, to handle it. Uh, in the agenda I was given, I need to point out a couple of things. Bill Boone is in the back. He is our GIS guy. He's the one that's waving in the back. Oh, okay. And the, the handsome gentleman back there. He is our GIS guru. He's the one that's been able to take and identify properties that are along the routes. Uh, we started out with six routes, we're now down to two, and we are looking forward to the alternatives report due out at the end of December or the beginning of January. And it is our understanding and our belief that that determination will feed into the EIS study that will then be undertaken to determine <coughs> what impacts that the uh, 
proposal will have on environment, on communities, um, financial aspect, uh, safety aspect, those kinds of things. Um, it was due out in August, then in September, after due out earlier this year. We now understand we were told two weeks ago that it would be the end of December, beginning of January, which would happen to be during the holiday season. Again, it goes to the transparency issue. That will feed into the EIS, which I expect they'll probably finish that come the draft EIS later next summer. So we're looking at this going to uh, Federal Railroad. They're the ones that will have to make the decision. They're the ones that will record the record of decision on whether to go forward or not. Probably the end of next calendar year or early 2020. Bill also is the one that is in the back that has the stop the train uh, signs for sale for a donation of five dollars. You can also uh, pull up and identify your property as to whether it is or is not along the route. As I said, the EIS is a major, major uh, study that, that is required in any federally uh, funded project and it's significant in this case because of the expected cost, they, they say it's going to be 10 to 12 billion dollars. Uh, some have looked at it and concluded that it's probably going to be closer to 30 billion dollars to go from Baltimore to Washington. Um, as I said, it'll, that'll look at the environment, it'll look at the economics of it, it'll look at the impact on communities, so that uh, it, it is, while, how do I want to put it, while they have to do the study. The study can come out and say it's not a good thing to do, and they can still make a decision to move forward on it. Um, I guess we're going to have questions, right? And you're going to introduce the elected officials. So I think more information can come out through the report study. Okay. 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 Just one second. Uh, Mr. Henley, who is the project, what's your exact title, Mr. Henley? Project Director. Project Director for Baltimore, Washington, Rapid Rail, right? Right. And you have, who are your two guests? I Crawford and Matt They are with the proponents, so <coughs> let's, let's be nice to them. We don't agree with them, but let's be nice to them. Welcome, welcome to this, and thank you for coming out. Thank you, Dan. So, uh, MDOT's role is solely to 
oversee the NEPA process along with the Federal Railroad Administration and administer the grant funding. The Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail is a private company proposing the system itself. There is no state funding of the Maglev project. We are currently working on the NEPA Alternatives Report, which we hope to finalize this fall, and next year we will publish the draft environmental impact statement. The draft impact statement will identify the preferred alternative. The Alternatives Report will provide more detail on the remaining two alternatives, the ancillary facilities like the maintenance facility, and the potential station locations. The no-build option is also being carried forward, which is a requirement for so with us tonight, we have taken, again, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule, is Patty Ewing. She's running for delegate for District 32. Pam Bottle, who is currently a delegate for District 32 and running for Senate. Please, when I say you want to stand so you can let people know who you are. Okay, Patty Ewing. Okay, Pam Bottle. Uh, Heather Campbell is here representing Senator Ben Cardin. Uh, John Grasso is here. He is also running for the Senate. Uh, Mark Bailey. Okay. Mark Bailey is here. He's running for District 32, delegate. Sandy Bartlett, also running for District 32, uh, delegate. Uh, Brigel Smith for Congressman Sarbanes. Did I say that correctly? Bridget. Bridget. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I, these are new classes. I'm <laughs> David Lasher, who is running for <laughs> District 3, okay, as a candidate. Welcome all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. 
First of all, environmental concerns. There's too many. There's too much at risk in your lives being more than me than getting somewhere 11 minutes faster. Cost, 10 to 12 billion dollars. That's projected. When they did a study back in 2008 and 2009, they looked at that study, and that study took between three and four billion dollars, with an estimated expenditure every year running that system by 60 million dollars. Now that was many years ago. So we can inflate those costs, and we're about 200 million dollars to operate. That to me is a significant concern. The cost of the travel itself will be unaffordable. We're already looking at cost for people just to run a, a normal rail system, $12 to $47. So what's the cost going to be? Are we going to be subsidizing yet another project? Funding to subsidize. Again, another you know, significant issue. There's no significant benefits in your own county. What's the benefits? How do we, how do we benefit from a rail system like that? Does it? Eminent domain. Sure, we're going to take your land, we'll take your property. How many people do you think are going to be affected? Approximately three, 300, roughly. We don't know until the impact study is fully completed. You've already heard the facts, I just reiterate it. Because I want you to understand, I have to be aware of what's going on with this project. Facts, starting in 2008, 2009, we already know that was a projected three to four billion dollars. Now we're looking at 10 to 12 billion. Cost, too, too much. Jobs, you preach jobs, you look for you 7,500 jobs, but those jobs will last for 7 to 10 years, then they're gone. Federal rail system is saying that it would create you know, 1,500 jobs. It's not a substantial amount. We already have the Amtrak system. There was a grant of $28 million that was in, that's been advanced by the federal government for a study of 40 million on the market. Is that right? I heard you're Is that correct? 27 million. So anyway, we're looking at 20 million. So who wants the bank left? I can tell you who wants it. Of course, the Japanese government, right? They would benefit from this because then they get to they get to look at the South Park community where it's going to affect you all. Who else? With all due respect to the gentleman who sits in the back, I work against the Magnet group. I understand they're developers. They want to they want to make improvements. They want to make advancements. We're all here for that. That's why we're in America. We had, if you look at 20, 2014, you had Pepper Miami, Tom Machino, Tom Dasha, pardon me if I say that wrong, three family brothers, and uh, it was reported that at that time it was $40 million invested to look at that study. And that was, a, that was an article that was written by the Bummer's Sun, 927, 2014. Federal government, you already heard that, $27 million in private ownership. Those are, the, those are the folks that have an interest. I'm going to tell you why I oppose it. Mr. Brass says, highway, one of the important things. You all, we, us, the community, the people that live here, we don't support it. We don't support something. Why are we going forward with it? There's no benefit to us. So here's what I came up with. This is the reason why we have opposition. First of all, the residents can't own the post. That's the most important thing. Secondly, we have an Amtrak that offers 36 rail trips per day from Baltimore to Washington and 738 rail trips per month. Still at reduced costs. The cost to operate, right now we're going to project $60 million. That's going to be the same way. And then we're going to end up having to subsidize it just like we do with light rail. It'll affect 300 to 375 homes. That's significant. That's your kids, grandkids, that's your futures. It's people who've been living there for a number of years. Service is important. I'm currently serving in the Maryland Army National Guard and Major. I serve above the board for the Maryland State Board of Morticians and Funeral Records. Service is extremely important. Ensuring that I pay out all the options before any decisions are made is what's in the best interest of everyone here. I'm finishing my doctorate in education. It's important for me to represent you as a people. And I'm going to go through a few things you've probably already heard, but I want to make sure we're clear. I'm going to take that like issue 32. <coughs> My email is elect.family.gmail.com. 
The reason why I give you that is because I want to have a written document so that we can move forward. When somebody sends me something, I want to make sure their voice is heard. There's no way of people leaving it. I don't do that. I have integrity. That's something that's been instilled in me for a very long time. I served the Maryland State Police, Freddy Butler and Parrot, serving the very community that you all live in. I'm opposed to the matter. I'm very much opposed. And there's many reasons why, and I think this is important as to why I oppose the Magnum. First of all, environmental concerns. It's too many. There's too much at risk in your lives more than me than getting somewhere 11 minutes faster. Cost, 10 to 12 billion dollars. That's projected. When they did a study back in 2008 and 2009, they looked at that study, and that study was between three and four billion dollars, with an estimated expenditure every year of running that system by 60 million dollars. Well, that was many years ago. So we can inflate those costs and look at about 200 million dollars off. That to me is a significant concern. The cost of the travel itself will be unaffordable. We're already looking at costs for people just to run a, a normal rail system, $12 to $47. So what's the cost of the people? Are we going to be subsidizing yet another project? Funding is subsidized. Again, no significant issue. There's no significant benefits in your own county. What's the benefits? How do we, how do we as a people benefit from a rail system like that? Does it? And then domain. We're going to take the land, we'll take the property. How many people do you think are going to be affected? Approximately three, 300, roughly. We don't know until the impact study is completed. You've already heard the facts, I'll just reiterate. Because I want you to understand, I have to be aware of what's going on with this project. Facts, study 2008 2009, we already know that was a projected three to $4 billion. Now we're looking at 10 to 12 billion. Cost, too, too much. Jobs. We, we preach jobs. We wouldn't create 7,500 jobs, but those jobs will last for 7 to 10 years, and they're gone. Federal rail system saying that we would create maybe 1,500 jobs. It's not a substantial amount. We already have the Amtrak system. There was a grant of $28 million that, that's been advanced by the federal government for a study, according to one of the articles I read. I hear it differently. Is that correct? 27.8. So, anyway, so who wants this anyway? I can tell you who wants it. Of course, the Japanese government, right? They would benefit from this because then they get to they get to put this out to our community where it's going to affect you all. Who else? With all due respect to the gentleman there who sits back and one of these magnet who I understand they're developers. They want to they want to make improvements, they want to make advances. We're all here for that. That's all we want in America. We've had, if you look at 20, in 2014, you had Kevin Klein, Tom Dashiell, Tom Dashiell, pardon me if I say that wrong, three former governors, and uh, it was reported that at that time it was $40 million invested to look at that study. And that was, that was an article that was written by the Baltimore Sun, 9 27, 2014. Federal government, we already heard that, $27 million, private ownership. Those are, the, those are the folks that have interest. I'm going to tell you why I oppose it. Mr. Grass has highlighted one of the important things. You all, we, us, the community, the people that live here, we don't support it. We don't support something why are we going forward with it. There's no benefit to us. So here's what I came up with. This is the reason why we have opposition. First of all, the president's handle on the post. That should be that's the most important thing. Second, we have an Amtrak that offers 36 rail trips per day from Baltimore to Washington and 738 rail trips per month. Still going to reduce costs. The cost to operate. Right now we're looking at projected $60 billion. That's going to continue to be And then we're going to end up having to subsidize it just like we do like now. It'll affect 300 to 375 homes. That's significant. That's your kids, grandkids, that's your futures, that's people who've been living there for a number of years. It's important to me. It does not improve the quality of life. It does not.
It doesn't, doesn't have to be common. In fact, it creates further burdens. The cost of consumers will be unaffordable. In fact, patients cannot pay for what they always see. We've read articles about the volatile donor system. <coughs> this will create a negative tax burden on all of us. Well, the advantages of the Medicaid training system and system for economics the themselves, they are not enough to overshadow the biggest problem, which is the Medicaid training, a high cost of curve in the initial setup. While the vast initial trends that have been introduced to lately work just fine, they can use some improvement, that's something we can work on. Impact. Although the tracks could be elevated, there would be uh, still an additional number of bridges and infrastructures to make that improvement. So as you heard, we listened to, what, another $30 billion. I remember when we were projects, when you're doing a project at your house, you always say, hey, you know what, I'm only going to spend $1,000. Then you get there, and you need a new door. The door is going to be the sweets. Now you need hinges. Now you need a new door knob. That $1,000 project now is only $2,000. So again, not something we want. Energy consumption. I've heard that it's going to be better than the energy consumption. Larger train cars are tough to levitate and require a great bit more energy, actually making them less efficient. Safety, I will give them credit on the safety. There is safety there. In fact, in one uh, train crash that I did in 2008 in Japanese Germany, that was an error to the uh, operator. But again, I don't see the value in the overall. So I'll leave you with this. The big truth about the high, high speed ground transportation system is that it's fast, but it comes with a cost. Maintaining safety comes at a price that cannot be eliminated or ignored, although it may seem desirable to build a system at the lowest, co lowest possible capital cost. The officials should always keep in mind that there are no financial shortcuts for public safety. The majority of people in the U.S. do not understand the pros and cons of high speed train systems. And I think this is my most important thing. I'm running as your state delegate for District 32. I stand before you tonight because I believe the message that I'm giving you. And this is my final statement. It is the responsibility of the government officials, whom the people trust, to make transportation policy decisions in the U.S. considering the pros and cons. If you like what I heard, then I ask you to vote for come November. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my time. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for everybody being here this evening. Thank you to Citizen Leslie Magdalene for all the work that they've done. From the very beginning, I stood with the Citizens Against Magdalene in opposing this project. Whether it was community meetings up here in the northern part of Ramon County, or the western part of Laurel, or down in Annapolis, the Lawrence Mall, we stood together to oppose this project. 2015, Governor Hogan was first elected. The very first trip he took was Pacific Rim. And because of that trip, it's the reason why we are here right now. Because the governor brought us a great idea. He had to sign off for this process to take place. 2017, President Trump is elected. Who's the very first foreign leader that he needs with? Prime Minister Abe, Prime Minister Japan. The full board president lobbyist is only going to be able to get this project here. And so it's important to realize that why I'm here and what decision makers put us in this situation. But I can say as a state legislator that I oppose it and I'll continue opposing it, specifically to in the last legislative session of Delegate by myself, we co sponsored legislation to thwart this project in the program and will continue to work on measures with the community to address it. Various environmental concerns and risks that are associated with this, from the death of where we're going in the communities to the wells in the area to the colonial pipeline that could possibly have risk that this 
five men. There's only five men of risk. There's so many out there. You've heard about the lack of transparency, not enough data, not enough information to make such a critical decision. We need to have all that information. And that's why there's so much risk associated. From the financial perspective, first of all, macroeconomically. From the macroeconomic perspective, we're talking about billions of dollars being allocated to a project that we really don't know much about. And what is really going to be the benefit? When you do the cost-benefit analysis, what is really the benefit to the U.S. citizens in America? Also, the other concern that I have is that a global perspective, look at the amount of sovereign wealth funds and the amount of international leverage that is on the United States. How much more billions of dollars, trillions of dollars, the United States government have to hurt other countries? And that's the position we're putting ourselves in with these financial investments leveraged by a foreign country. Like we've been on pivoted that to the Jewish consumers, the price point. We heard about the price point not being really in the reach of the average person. Just recently I was in Philadelphia for our leadership program. I competed back and forth today from BWI to Philadelphia. And this transportation structure that we have right now with the rail system, my personal perspective as a consumer, someone who used that, we can definitely take the investments that we have, and the investment in current systems that we do have, to make it more efficient. And also save, really, the taxpayers, you, billions of dollars. And the last thing I want to mention is social aspect. This is personal to me. We're talking about a country who wants to invest in the state of Maryland, and in my opinion, really has leverage in the state of Maryland. This is a country who, if you do the research, has committed many atrocities in the global warfare. Really, if you want to have to be leveraged by a country who does not apologize for the sins of the war atrocities that they committed, I'm not going to give away too much detail about that, but as a student of global history, that's also another concern that I have. But we're going to continue to fight this together. Let the government's a great community. You all have a winning record. Just recently up in North Lithuania, the community got together. North Lithuania, the Lithuania Ship and Food Association, Presto, all the different communities working together. And they were able to stop the event of Lithuania from going on there. But it wasn't because of one person. It was because of the community, the elected officials, and partnerships being developed and all working together to stop projects like that that had adverse effects on communities. The takeaway from this tonight is to continue to work together and with that we'll be able to hopefully stop this project from coming in. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to represent you. What is my position on this particular issue? I oppose. Period. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, so I'm not going to go into great length as to why I oppose, but I will tell you that I am an attorney, and I look at this based on my core document, the Supreme Law of the Land, the U.S. Constitution. The Fifth Amendment says that we, as the public, we will not lose our property except in certain conditions, eminent domain, where there is a, or where there is um, going to be used for public use. Okay, maybe they may get that mark, But for the public benefit. So if we have groups like this get together and say if we don't want it, it's not for our benefit. So then of course you ask yourself, for whose benefit is it? And is it constitutional? I'm not going to give you my legal opinion right now because none of you are all hating me tonight. But I will say that it is not for the public benefit. If the majority of the public is saying no. So that's the argument that they're going to have to present. How does this benefit us? 
I take the, I have used to take the Mark train. I used to work around downtown, downtown Bay Street, downtown DC. I took the Mark train. Love the Mark train. It's already here. Let's improve on it. I took the Metro. It's already here. Let's improve on it. We got the BW Parkway. It's already here. Let's improve on it. Let's work with what we have. Let's not tear down our homes. Let's keep our homes and improve what we have. So once again, like I said, I thought I'm preaching too far on this. So if I can get an amen, that's okay too. But let me just tell you, you can win on this one. Sandy Barber, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Mr. Smith, representing Congressman Sarbanes. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of Congressman Sarbanes. As many of you know, he's um, Congress in session. That's what he is. He sends his regrets. Sit in a little bit nicer seat. You 
what the difference in time in arrival is? 20 minutes. It's 20 minutes. By the time these high speed trains make all their stops, the difference in the overall trip is negligible. I think what's most concerning to me, though, is that is, is what we heard at the outset of this meeting, which is that it sounds like the process of reviewing and approving or disapproving the project has not been open and transparent on something that's highly expensive. It's going to have an impact on the environment. And it's going to be disruptive to communities. So I'm going to Uh, 
Um, I'm not aware of the answers. It's the question that the CIS has to look at. That's one of the things that we'll have to do that uh, with Japan. Japan may have more on the global war, on the tax system as well. All those kinds of questions got to ask the as well. So it's a good question. We're making those questions. Thank you. One of the things I say, if I remember correctly, uh, healing is an inner task assignment. Right. So it doesn't react naturally with any other element. So if it is using in the air, especially in liquid form, we just get to a gaseous form and just. Yes, I'm worried about asphyxiation. Oh, I'd like asphyxiation on the train, since it's actually on the train or any, anyone in the area. Okay, so. Thank you very much for taking that down. This is a good opportunity. That's an excellent question. What you, I would suggest that you do is we have two uh, websites, stoplifttrain.org or our Facebook page, Citizens of SC Mad Lab. That has information on who to contact. You ought to submit your question to MTA as a, as a question related to this, an issue related to this. Ask the question and seek an answer from them and ask them to evaluate it. Why do you do that? Copy all of your um, legislative representatives, your elected uh, officials, county, state, and federal on that question. Alert them that, that you've asked this question. And any other question. You know, part of the NEPA study is going to look at things, but they don't know everything. You live in this community, you know of different things. So if you have a question, you ask an item, and they go home, you, you think about it. Go on our webpage, find the point of contact at MPA, and submit that question because that's how uh, the process works. In order to evaluate it, they need to know the question. So it's a very good question. I commend it for us. And I would also suggest making sure you send a copy of your question to the Dennis or myself because we will keep a calculation of them so when we get a chance to look at the EIS, we'll look for those questions and see if they can. And I can find that on the uh, Facebook? Yes, it's on Facebook. It's, uh, you have to do Facebook, but I'll figure yeah. it out. Stop. As well <laughs> as the website, which is uh, Stop This Train. 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 Can we get you a mic? There's the official EIS website as well, which is just your most direct connection. Okay.
You also have three to four power sources. You're going to have to have low resistance to have one million circles. What land is that going to be? You're going to have to constantly be by tension. This is power resistance. Go in the left hand right now and you're going to have to have high tension. I'm going to have to have low resistance to have one million circles. No. So, I mean, this has more resistance to have a circle facility. There's all these other pieces that have to be built. All of it takes time. And the whole thing about it is that it is. They're talking about tunnel, but you've got to put these three, you know, three, three four bundles. You've got a surface facility of some kind that's going to be built. Hoping that when the EIS comes back, there'll be more information on that so we have a better idea of where they're going to be looking and the kind of displacement and disruption that's going to be to our community. When you get down into Prince George's County, my friends in the neighborhood, when they go above ground, I think Montrose or McNeil is looking at. The current area has approximately 150 homes that could be demolished. Now, that's not the final one. There may be some adjustments, but the current one, just that one piece is 150 homes. Another question for the, for the candidates. Yeah. But I guess, like, what would it take for 
were to actually connect to like other states, like I guess there's a lot to talk about. Maryland getting Fed money. But I mean would New York have to be like, oh yes, we agree to the Fed money and then the bag would possibly go to New York or I guess that's just curious. When you listen to Mr. Ryan complain on and your CEO talk about the bag money. He touts the fact that you can get to New York right now. They're going to New York. There's Pickney, uh, the second between Baltimore and Washington. In our estimation, they picked and pick and be the least consistent segment. But once they have that, they'll use that to leverage the approval further north. To go north from Baltimore to New York, they're going to have to go through a similar BIS project, a process. Look at it, the impact of what happened. But believe me, if they, if they get approval for the first link, it's probably a done deal that they'll go to New York. If they get funding to do it, we have heard 10 to 12 billion dollars to build this. That's the number that's been floating around since they went to the PSC. It's about a five-year-old number. Oh. Uh, public Service Commission, they're the ones that made the determination of the license. Uh, so that's a five-year-old number. We actually have people who have looked at similar projects like this uh, in our group. We believe that the number to go from Baltimore to Washington, given it's 75% of the ground now, will probably approach $30 billion. So it's a significant one. Going back to the previous question, they need approval. The, the, the uh, record of decision needs to give approval for them to go forward. All that does is give the federal government permission for them to go forward. The ball then goes to their board to arrange funding to, to get investors and get banks and, and others that will support their venture in order to move forward. So, you know, there's two different steps here. But without the, you know, the regulators, the uh, FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, makes a determination and says, no, they can't go further. If they say yes, then it's up to them to arrange the financing and figure out how to do it, figure out what the real costs are. If you look at High Speed Rail in California and other places, major projects, the big dig in Boston, these mega projects, uh, billion plus projects, tend to have large crossroads once they get started. And the reason for that is that the proponents oversell the economic benefit and grossly underestimate the true cost of the project. And then you get the regulators and the elected officials who are ill prepared to make a determination, an informed decision when they give their approval. And then you go down a way, if you look at what's going on in California, they've already had uh, a doubling, a tripling of the original billion dollar plus cost of their project. And they're still building it in order to do something. But that goes to clarify your, your question. David. David, you're here. Listen to the conversation. I'm listening to the discussion of private property rights, homeowners, and uh, I'm listening about eminent domain. I'm hearing about big corporate uh, funded kind of projects that uh, may or may not have benefit for the community. But what I wanted to do was recommend that everybody watch a movie. And there's a movie called Little Painting House. Little Painting House. It was released about a year ago. It is about exactly these issues. And it is about the importance of the community, like the worst step forward with that much rights. Little pinheads. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Little pink house. Little pink house. Little pink house. This name has been mentioned a lot just in a different way. We all know this is going to cost billions of dollars to make. We all know that the homeowners are going to be displaced whether they want to pay or whether they're going to lose money and sell their homes or whether they have to move. But is there a budget to place 30 or 40 years where this infrastructure needs to be repaired? Is that something that's being mentioned to families that have to give up so much that the government's going to have to spend so much money to maintain this new mode of transportation? That's actually to everything that's being mentioned tonight. That is a very good question. 
Une responsabilité, je suis d'accord. <rire> Again, I have a very good question that we're looking to the EIS to see uh, what the answer is going to be because there is that question has been raised. One of the areas that we're digging through that we have on the county is uh, a large aquifer that uh, we actually rely on our drinking water for. So, again, yeah, that's a very good question. Okay. Uh, I have a question that I don't expect to have an answer, but um, there's much mention about health effects. I know you mentioned it before, but there's a lot of things that we, we as a country and developers do that affects us 10 years down the road. We don't see what the potential impacts are. So that's one of my concerns is, you know, this isn't a tested product that's been out there for long enough to know, oh wait, we should never have done this. Um, so that's, that's the one question I have. And then um, the other question I have is, um, when they tunnel, um, I don't expect that they're going to be able to tunnel and not damage nearby properties. So though that they're going to purchase the homes that they will take out, what about the homes that are around it when they're pouring through there and then suddenly everything's getting displaced, you know, and doing damage to everybody's homes? Is there a fund that's going to pay for that type of damage? That is a good question. I don't know the answer. However, I can say that the Japanese have actually been running a VSC magnet, this technology, for a number of years. They have not reported uh, any health issues related to it as a result of the SC magnet and being exposed to my uh, magnetic fields or whatever. But then again, you're not going to be quote unquote that close to it. Okay. When you ride, if I understand it, the technology correctly, the chain, the train itself is relatively shielded. Or is shielded from the magnetic field. Okay. So they have not reported any. Connie and company, if I correct, they have not reported any health issues associated with the uh, actual technology. I'm sorry? There is testing and rollout which the EIS Yes, and we were expecting to see all of that in the EIS. And the damage to the is any That is a good question. Uh, again, if you have questions like that, is, like, you know, we don't know the answers to. It's great to go ahead and send them in you know, and make sure that we get a copy of it because then we will look for that in the EIS to see if it's been addressed. And make sure also to copy the elected officials. Because that's something they should be aware of too. As people are starting to live right now, I wanted to leave a time for you all to actually meet one on one or small group with candidates. Uh, why don't we uh, create a close of that? Okay, Susie. Okay, I'm not going to walk up on the seat. Um, yeah, as he said, several candidates, incumbents, and the leadership of CATS will stay following the meeting for one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations if you'd like to have them. And we want to thank all of you for attending. And for more information on ISC Maglov, go to stopthistrain.org. And you can follow on their Facebook pages or Citizens Against the SC Maglov as well. So we're going to close the meeting now and we reserve the auditorium until 10, but I don't expect to stay here till then. So feel free to come and talk with us and thank you again. And for anyone who's going to be sitting out in the new one, you tell them what your address is. ESGIS software that will tell you the distance of your home from one of the proposed and he also has the signs back here for Stop Us Train Download if you'd like one. If you'd like one, you can answer the five dollars and request the privilege. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming out and please welcome.